Hello, my name is Patrick. I'm the park tech here at Crowder County Park in Stork Gates Mill County Park. And today, we're going to go on a hike, well, a virtual hike. Uh, so a few things before you get going is to know how to be safe on a hike. One, gotta have a good stick right here. And this is a good one as you can tell. Uh, two, always make sure someone else knows where you're going on a hike, whether that's your parents, a friend, just so if you were to get lost, they know where to find you. Uh, and that kind of leads into know where you're going. Don't go somewhere you don't know uh, unless you have a nice map. And another important thing in the woods is don't collect anything. Uh, you don't always know what you're touching. It could be dangerous. So you just want to make sure you aren't putting yourself into danger. And it's always a good idea to have a bottle of water too. But uh, let's go. What do we have here? We have ourselves, it looks like a toad. And usually with amphibians and reptiles, you don't want to handle them because the oils and sometimes chemicals on our skin can harm their skin. But toads are usually safe. They have more tougher skin than most frogs or salamanders. So this little guy here, and if you want to come down here, here in North Carolina, two of our mo or our two more common species of toads are Fowler's and American's toads. And so they can come in all kinds of different colors, gray, red, brown, and even really bright red sometimes. Uh, so they can be, depending on where you find them, they'll be different colors. But telling them apart is a fun little story. The easiest way to tell them in the field is look at their black splotches. So both Americans and Fowler's toads will have these black splotches, splotches with warts in them. Whereas Americans, American toads will have only one or two warts per splotch. Fowler's toads will have three, four, or even more sometimes. And as we can see here on these, these black splotches, it's one, two, three right there, one, two, three right there, and a few more with three. So this guy is a Fowler's, Fowler's toad. And for those of you who can whistle, if you hum and whistle at the same time, it gives you a pretty good idea of what they sound like. <laughs> A UFO sound, I think. <laughs> Go on, buddy. Oh, we'll let, let him be. So another good thing about a walking stick in the woods, especially this time of year with spiders, is you can use it as what I like to call a spider stick. Now, it's not a patented idea, so don't go stealing it from me, but it is a very developed uh, piece of technology. No spiders in our faces today. Oh, what do we have here? So this is pretty cool. This is what is known as a snag, or as you can see, it's just a dead tree, but not just a dead tree. Uh, this is actually an old uh, black cherry tree. I don't know how long it's been dead, but they are some of the most important things in our forests. Uh, to us, they look just like, well, just some dead wood standing, but to insects and birds and other animals, this is a, a buffet and the best apartment place, the best apartment complex you can live in. If we were to open this up, it'd be full of termites, insects, and all kinds of other uh, little creepy crawlies that are great food for our feathered friends. In this case, woodpeckers. This is Woodpecker City. Uh, and here in North Carolina, we have a pretty good number. Let's see, we, we know we have the red-headed woodpecker, the red-bellied woodpecker, the pileated woodpecker, uh, yellow-bellied sapsucker, then the northern flicker, which is actually the biggest woodpecker in North America. Some people might say we have ivory-billed woodpeckers here, but I don't think we do. But anyway, this is what they love. A lot of times, if you come up here you, and you look up, you'll actually see them up there hammering their head away. So you might wonder why woodpeckers can't get headaches or won't get headaches from all that hammering away they do on wood. Well, it's actually a cool adaptation they have. Their skull is actually cushioned by their tongue. So woodpeckers have a very flexible, strong tongue that they use to get into their holes that they make in, in the dead wood, and that tongue is so long it wraps around the back of their head and back out of their beak and forms a, a pillow, if you will, when they right into the wood. So just another cool adaptation, a lot of... So this, these are pretty cool. And what looks just like an old log rolled over on the forest floor is actually one of the more diverse and lively places in the forest. So just like our snag over there we just talked a little bit about, uh, logs provide 
a pretty stable environment for things to live in. You can imagine underneath the log, it doesn't get rained on as much, it doesn't get as much sunlight, so it, the temperature, the humidity, the conditions stay pretty stable, so a lot of animals seek these places out. So a really fun thing to do on any hike is to roll over logs and see what you can find. And if you don't like creepy crawlies like uh, centipedes, worms, millipedes, slugs, uh, you might not like doing this, but those are the cool things I think. So let's see. And one thing, you never want to, you always want to flip a log over away from you because there could be something under there you don't want coming after you. So make sure you open it so it goes away from you, like this. And so underneath here, there's a few, there's some termites, some grubs, a lot of little insects. And you can kind of see all of this little frilly, what looks like silk almost, is actually a mushroom fungi or mycorrhizae. They're little tendrils and you can think of them, they aren't roots, but you can kind of think of them as roots of mushrooms. And actually here is some old snake skin. So with all the insects that live under here, you can imagine all our fossorial snake species or snakes that live under the leaf litter really like to find out these places to eat all the earthworms. Uh, so snakes like our rough earth snakes, our brown snakes, even our worm snakes, and uh, even ringneck snakes, which are all, they don't get much bigger than that. Each of those species I just named uh, like to hide under these places. And in the spring, and even this time of year even, it's a good place to find salamanders. We have some kind of insect eggs right here. I do not know what kind they are. Uh, but a lot of cool stuff. You never know what you're gonna find under each log. And after you're done looking, it's always important to roll it back just like you found it. So our creepy crawly friends don't get too upset. Let's see what's under another one. So depending on how decomposed the log is, a lot of times you'll find different things underneath them. That one is not as decomposed as this one, so you might find more snakes or salamanders or uh, animals that eat the other animals underneath those, while these more wet, spongy logs are generally just going to find insects and worms. So here pretty decomposed, right? We have one big old mealworm. He looks like, I don't know what kind of larva he is, but he's probably a wood beetle larva, those big black wood beetles you see. It's just because how big he is. And you could actually eat these guys. Don't do it. Uh, oh, here we go. So here is the back part of what that guy turns into. He has another head, so you can see he's going to be pretty big. You never know what you're gonna find underneath the log. There's actually some, looks like maybe a coral fungus coming up underneath here. Huh. Well, I hope you guys are ready to party, because these guys are uh, what looks like just, well, snow or white fluff on these lower beech tree. This is a beech tree, American beech tree. Or actually, it's a big collection of aphids. And these are called dancing aphids, as you can see, if you were to uh, shake them just a little bit, they start dancing. And I don't know if you guys can tell it on the video, but they're dropping a very small amount of liquid, and that's called honeydew. And a lot of times, uh, insects will come and eat that from them. But yeah, they don't really cause any harm to the plant, in this case the beech tree. Uh, they just use it as a host, more or less, and have some crazy parties on it. Dance aphids. about halfway up there's a big looks like a bundle of brown leaves almost like a squirrel's nest it's not a squirrel's nest that's actually what's called resurrection fern uh, 
and I love the scientific name. It's Cleopeltis polyploides. It's really fun to say. Tongue twister. Uh, but what makes it special is it's called Resurrection Fern for a reason. It can pretty much dry out almost completely, and then when it gets a little bit more rain, a little bit more moisture, it can resurrect itself and become a green living fern. It never dies completely. It always has a little bit of life force left, if you will, ready to call back into action. But a lot of times it'll be dormant a lot of the times of the year until it's ready to reproduce and come back into being. But yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. You'll find it growing a lot of times on oak trees and other hardwood species. Resurrection. Entire time we've been out here hiking, we've been hearing a certain noise. It sounds like a, a buzz, like a zzz and a ch -ch 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 -ch. almost like a car when it doesn't start right. It just grrr, sounds kind of funky. Uh, those are cicadas, and I'm looking for one, one that's maybe fallen out of the trees, but I'm not having any luck. But what makes them special is they are, uh, they only come out every few years. There are a few species around here that come out every year and those are the ones we know the most uh, like the dog day cicadas. But this year especially we had the brood nine cicadas come out. I forget which species they were exactly but I think they took seven years to mature. So cicadas they'll come out, mate, and then die and they'll lay their eggs and they'll make their way into the soil where they'll turn into a grub and lie in the ground for about seven years in that one species case until that seven years is up. They'll come out, emerge, and go crazy. The best time of day to hear them is right around evening, maybe half an hour to an hour before sunset. They get very active. Oh, here we are with a nice friendly oak tree. So in the fall, not only do leaves fall, but also acorns, which you guys are probably familiar with, but did you know there's not just one kind of acorn? Not every acorn is made the same. So I've collected a few as we've been walking, and while most of them are the same kind, there are a few that are different. So these are all white oak acorns, and these are red oak acorns. And those are the two uh, sides of the oak family tree, if you will. Red oaks and white oaks might be asking what makes them different why is one the other and the other not well the answer kind of lies within their acorns so if we were to pop open a white oaks acorn the inside the fruit of the acorn itself will actually be white we're actually able to find some of last year's red oak acorns from this water oak right here, which is in the red oak family. And if we crush it and, it might be a subtle difference, but it is much more red than the white oak acorns. Uh, this one's a little bit easier to tell. It's much more red. And while it might be a more orange or yellowish color, the other ones are almost very white, as you would be able to see. Another difference between red oaks and white oaks is white oak acorns will always fall in the fall, while red oak acorns will fall in the spring. And that's because red oak acorns will sprout in the fall, or excuse me, will sprout through the winter. That's why they need a little bit more fuel in their acorn. Whereas red oak acorns, because they're smaller, will fall in the spring and germinate right there and then. They don't have to make it through winter like our white oak acorns do. So one thing I forgot to mention is uh, another thing about an acorn is what gives them their color. So that red color comes from what are called tannins. Tannins are uh, naturally found in oak trees and other plants. Like you can be find them in red wine, for example. Uh, and what they do is they kind of prevent insects and other uh, disease from infiltrating the oak plants themselves. So it's kind of like neosporin for a tree, if you will, that they always have. But that's why acorns are red, and at least the red oaks, they have more tannins than white oaks. And a fun fact, so fun fact about tannins, way back when, before we had factories and a lot of other things that made leather for us, uh, well, 
The process of creating leather is called tanning. And what they would do before factories and whatnot would make it for us, they would find an old oak stump or an oak tree and then cut it down if it wasn't cut down, dig out the stump, let water fill it back in, and then place their animal skins in there, and the tannins in the oak already would naturally tan the leather. So tanneries, tannins, that's, they're all one and the same when it comes to where the words come from. So one plant when you're in the woods that's always a good idea to look out for is poison ivy. And a lot of times it'll be on the ground. And another, or another, it also likes to grow up along trees. So you never want to touch it, but it's okay to touch it with a stick. But if it's this hairy vine right here. And a good adage to live by, if you're not sure whether it's poison ivy or not, is if it's hairy, it's scary. If it's hairy, don't touch it. Uh, the vine is very, very hairy, as you can see, and it's easily recognizable. Don't mess with it or you'll break out of a terrible rash. But it doesn't always grow in a vine. A lot of times it'll just be on the ground. Uh, so the other way to remember what poison ivy looks like and to think of is leaves of three, let it be. So if it has, if it comes up and it only has three leaves per stem or per uh, branch, if you will, don't touch it. To me, they kind of look like mittens. Whereas each side will have a little thumb, thumb lobe kind of on each, each little side of the leaf. And the middle one will not have those. But just think of like two mittens, if you will. And you can see it, it's pretty, it grows a lot around the vines because it does have berries on them. And that's how it spreads. But it can branch out, so it can even almost look like a tree but you just want to be very careful with poison ivy. But yeah, it's, it's very important for wildlife, especially in the winter. The birds love the berries in the winter. So it spreads pretty easily and it's good for the environment. It's native, it's not invasive or anything like that. Just, it can annoy us and bubble up our skin. What we have here is what's known as an arrow-headed flatworm, or arrowhead flatworm. And they call them that because if you look at his, or hammerhead flatworm, I'm sorry. They call him that because if you look at his head, it looks just like a hammerhead. And these guys, believe it or not, are actually predators. They are a non-native species, so he sh we, unfortunately, they should not be here. But uh, they eat earthworms. So they live in the same general areas as earthworms. You know, you can see his habitat here, a rotten log. but. You know, just like after a rain, earthworms will come out. These guys will come out and hunt them. And he's very slimy, uh, like a slug, but he won't hurt you to touch him. They just look very, very evil. But they aren't good. A lot of times they'll be in your garden. They do eat earthworms, and earthworms are some of the most important things in the soil. So just like any invasive non-native species, he's not good to find. So thanks for coming out with us guys. Uh, hope you enjoyed those few tips and maybe learned a little bit. Uh, now all I gotta do is go out and explore and our beautiful Crowder Park is a great place to do it or historic Gates Mill. Hope to see you out there. Bye.